Hey everybody, welcome to the Food and Fitness Podcast. This week we're following up on last week's episode where we talked about financial literacy. We're your hosts, Dave Marshall, Jessica White, and Jackie Vandertoon. So you can find us on all places, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at food.fitnesspodcast. So we are just going to follow up on uh, what we talked about last time about financial literacy. So just before we hit record, we actually had a fantastic conversation about things like mortgages and savings and RSPs. And one thing that really came out and uh, was a, a great point is savings is something that might be a privilege. Now, when we're having this conversation, I think all three of us we're not saying it, but there is a feeling inside of us going, we're in a fortunate enough position right now where we can talk about savings or we can have savings or where our thoughts are different because we've gone through the history of our lives. I'm very fortunate because, yeah, we don't have uh, kids. So that's not something that we have to financially think about on top of uh, raising kids. Now, when some of us are to a point where you're getting maybe within the 20 years of facing retirement, or you have a business and you're looking at um, having some adjustments, those are some different stresses that can come on. So I just want to ask you both, have you noticed any differences about yourself or your stress levels when your education, when you started to educate yourself when it came to financial literacy? Jess, you want to start with you? Yeah, I think the beginning of my financial literacy started way back when I was in high school. I got my first job. I think I was like 14 when I had my first job and it was paid cash, but I was, it was pretty good. Solid $8 an hour back when I was 14. I know the numbers for students are a little bit higher now, but the world was different back then. I had this, this decent paycheck and I was like, okay, I'm going to put it in my bank account and I'm not going to touch it. You're 14 living at home. Didn't have a car. I didn't have cell phones back then. So I just kept collecting. And then once I had a decent money, a just decent amount in there, I was like, okay, what am I going to do? And I started saving for school. And then I ended up going to school. And I remember in college calculating, I had my tuition, I had residence and groceries and putting together the budget of what I'm going to spend. And I thought back then that I was stressing over what I was spending, but I wanted to make sure that I didn't have to use my loans or my credit cards for the daily living type thing. So budgeting was super important. And I think I calculated back then I was spending like $120 a day to go to school. So I made sure that I had two jobs. I work on weekends and after school to counterbalance all of that. So to me, literacy didn't really include having the RSPs or any of the other savings. It was more so just how do I not go into debt? And I think that's a big part of what we talked about earlier in in the the last podcast about the, the bad debt. I didn't want to have credit cards or anything. I do know that mortgage and even car loans sometimes considered your good debt for your credit rating scores and everything. And then when I finished school, paying that loan off as fast as I could. And I didn't really even think about setting up an RSP or um, my retirement at anything because I felt like I had to pay off my student loan and the bad debt before I started savings. And that kind of stuck with me for a little bit. And I think that is when you do need to start thinking about your savings But that was a struggle that I dealt with because how do I save money when I have debt? And I think a lot of people have that struggle. It wasn't until I put all of that aside and realized you are always going to have some type of debt, but you do need to think about your future and sitting down and talking with a financial advisor to figure out what that looks like. How do you save? How do you budget when, you know, you might not have an incredible amount of income coming in, but how do you put aside a percentage so that you can still live within your means, but think about your future too? Jackie, how did you feel after you became a little bit more financially literate? I don't know if I'm financially literate because I guess it's, I am, you know, part of the conversation we had earlier is I am super low risk because I don't have any interest in reading the stocks and I, I don't really pay that much attention. 
but my financial literacy, the, so when I was 19, I read a book called The Wealthy Barber. And that's really where my financial literacy came from. But it really, it, he had these kind of roles, like he was a barber who was really wealthy, but it was a great story. I highly recommend that book. I don't work for David Children or, but if you're wanting to learn something about financial advisor literacy, read that book. But one of the things that struck out to me, two things was he used the adage of pay yourself first. And that was mentioned during our huddle or our, our financial uh, podcast about paying yourself first. And so when I was a kid, I read this and I'm like, oh, I'm going to start some RSPs. So I was 19. I was like, oh, I'm going to start some RSPs, 50 bucks a month I'd throw in there. However, I also went to university and had to pull out those RSPs. And then financially, we struggled because I was in school forever. But I think it's really important. And the things that we talked about as well with the group, we're really all middle class, highly educated people. And so our financial literacy might be a little bit easier. I never had to pay for anything going through school or going growing up. My parents weren't wealthy by any stretch of the means, but I want it for nothing. I didn't have to work for a job to help pay for the family expenses like you, Jess. My first job, I paid, got paid $3.50 and it was my money. I paid for my university, but I didn't have to pay for any housing because I lived with my parents as well. So I recognize how part of the conversation we're having is really biased towards us and the culture probably that we grow up in. So I don't know what it's like to have to be in a lifestyle where you have to struggle growing up. I look at my kids' friends and I see some of them doing that. And yeah, that breaks my heart because uh, I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, you are so lucky because you're growing up in a situation where you really won't have to worry about a lot. But my financial literacy came when I had two kids and Randy was really supporting us because I was in graduate school. And uh, we were struggling to pay our mortgage. And I came across this show, and I can't remember it, right? Gail Vass Oxley. And uh, it was this Canadian show, which I loved, but people, she would pull people out of their financial ruination. And she used to have these mason jars. And she would say, and this is when we paid with cash, right? Debit cards didn't exist. And you would budget out each week your monthly allotment in your mason jars. And it was hard. You had gas money. So $40 would go in. We're talking about gas that's cheaper than two bucks a liter. Um, so $40 would go in the mason jar and $120 went in the grocery jar and you couldn't go over it. And you were like, okay, I just want it to be, if I can put 35 and then save five. But I remember saying to the kids, they were like, hey, can we go visit somebody? I'm like, no gas in the car. And we can't go any place until Monday. And it was like Friday or something. So we spent all weekend at home. That's where my financial literacy came from is growing up and knowing to pay yourself first. Yes, I have a financial planner and uh, we say all the time how blessed we are with the situation we're in, but it's interesting. And I love the fact that we're different ages and just, I think you're the youngest of us. I am, my husband and I were like 15 years from retirement and we're starting to get a little bit more. Do we have enough money set aside to last us for the rest of how long we live? I don't know. We ballpark 90 years old, but I think that's where the financial advisor helps us is to give us peace of mind knowing that, hey, you know what, Jackie, you've got a pension, you've got RSPs, you're good. What do you want to do? And so for us, that's how we figure it out. But again, pay yourself first. We, both my husband and I have a savings account and we have fun money and that's our money that we pay ourselves first. But I'm super lucky to be able to do that. Yeah, I don't have any big education. I don't follow the stocks. I just, I trust my financial advisor, probably blindly, but yeah. Yeah. How about you, Dave? So I think one thing that I can remember as a kid is my mom would say, oh, we can't afford it. I'm like, oh, just go to the wall. And that's something that I said. And to me, that was like, just go to the ATM machine, grab the money and comes out of the wall. Like that, <laughs> at a, as a young age, you have no concept of money, but then you also have other parents who would teach their kids. If you say you want a basketball, you pay for half of it and I'll pay for half of it. And then kids would learn how to, you know, save their birthday money or their bar mitzvah money or 
any kind of income that they had of one way, their tooth fairy money, whatever it was. But when I was a kid, it, it wasn't something that was of con like of a concept to me. And that translated into like my early 20s, like money would go out as quickly as it came in or sometimes even faster. And I wasn't the greatest with it. And then I, I got into a little bit of credit card issue, but then like I had to look at that. I was like, okay, I can invest or I can pay down. But then I like I see I had a serious conversation of if I'm saving right now, is it growing fast enough to make up the difference of the interest that I'd be paying on this loan? Or if I just paid this off like right away and sacrificed everything, how much would I save by doing that? So that's the direction that I chose. And then marrying a woman who is very different when it comes to her mind, like financial mindset, she was very much a saver and I was very much a spender. And now I'm much more a saver. I'm still a spender, but in things that are worth it. And that's where my financial um, mindset is now is I'm investing in things that I am going to take out of. I don't, when we travel, yeah, we, we travel and we have a great time. Or if we go over dinner, we're going to make sure that we have a good time at the place we go. And my wife has started to become slight, a little bit more when it comes to spending, which is totally fine. But when we first got married, she was at school and we basically were on like one and a quarter um, incomes. And things were very different then of what they are now. And for us, that was a fantastic education and an experience to go through. And now we were able to put money away so we can save for the future. And for us, we both realized that we are in a good spot. We're fortunate to be where we are. If things were to fall apart, we could survive for a little bit. And I think for us, that's really important. And we can't buy a house right now. It's just not financially possible. And we're okay with that. We love where we live. We love the town that we live and we love the place that we're in. So for us right now, we're doing um, what we think is best and as best as we can and just being responsible with the money that we have and that we're spending. Yeah, Yeah, I think, and and we're struggling with that a little bit with my 19 year old is, and we're talking about that because, and I'm not bragging, I, I recognize daily how blessed I am that financially we are where we are, but we're thinking we need to push the bird from the nest. And I know that sounds like this is what I'm struggling with from a financial perspective, meaning that you need to leave the house, right? Like you don't know how good you've got it. Fridge is always full. House is always warm. You want for nothing. And I think it makes people a little complacent for people who have been given everything. And we're like, "Uh, the boots coming, but it's really hard to push you out of the nest. (laughs) Yeah. And real world experience, it opens your eyes, makes you realize what how other people can live too it's that's it's really tough because you never want them to leave home will always be home but it's good to get the outside experience yeah when you asked about the education I think that's really where my education came from is 120 dollars in the jar the 40 dollars for the gas I like you Dave like money meant nothing to it really doesn't mean a lot to me right now but my education came from having to know I got to save for tomorrow. Like I got to buy groceries tomorrow and I'm the only person, obviously my husband's making the money, but I'm the one, I can't go to my money tree in the backyard and start picking bills off. I can make this work. And it's the school of hard knocks. I know that sounds really bad because it sounds horrible in 2022 to say the school of hard knocks, but sometimes that's where you're forced to be educated. So Yeah, I have a question for you guys, because I I reflect back on my financial life, and we talked about this before as well, how in in 20 years ago, my stress about money would be super high. And again, now it's, I don't even think about it. How about your stress, maybe at a financial difficult time, and at a time where finances were not really that big of a deal? Jess, how about you? Do you find a difference in your stress level? I feel like I have always stressed about being in debt but that has changed more over the years because I'm totally honest when I finished 
uh, college because I worked through, I worked my butt off at jobs throughout college. When I was done my third year, I only owed, and I say only, it's still a lot of money, but I only owed $14,000. And I was stressed that I, I was like, okay, you have this, the six month grace period. I'm going to work and pay this all off. So I don't have to pay any interest. And now things are different because obviously I have the house, I have a car, there's debt involved with all of that. And that stresses me out too. I remember when we got the house, I was like, okay, how can we, what term can we get where I have this paid off? So I'm mortgage free by the time I'm 40. Cause I didn't want to be, I didn't want to have a mortgage for the rest of my life. And it, that it stresses me out. I don't like owing anybody anything. I don't like being in debt. So that definitely irks me and it is worrisome, but at the same time, debt aside, I really want to live within my means. So it, it is always on my mind. Dave, how about you and money and stress compared to the financial situation and the best financial situation? How does that change your stress level? So I think I, I can think of two times, like back when I just, I wasn't in a, in a good financial position, I was ignorant of it. It's hard to admit to yourself that you're in a tough spot, but then it's even harder to admit to other people that you're in a tough spot. And I think we need to get away from that where people shouldn't be shamed if you're like, hey, let's go for dinner. And they're like, I'm cool. That shouldn't be a thing because we have no idea why not. And it could be the difference between going out for dinner or putting food on the table for your family. And that's where I was at one point. And it was just to the point where having to tell other people and worried about how they were going to think of me, that was an issue. But more recently, let's go to, let's just even say the last six months. If you're on a fixed income of say salary or whatever, but inflation is taking off, gas is $1.75 a liter, groceries are not costing what they used to before. You got to, you think of your life as a business and it's, it sounds terrible, but you have to, because if your income and your expenses you need to hopefully be making a profit when you're on a steady income, but some things are changing. You have to try and balance that out. And that's the hardest thing that I know a lot of people are having a tough time going through first a time, even when my job income was fluctuating and it wasn't going up, but expenses were, and there was nothing that we could do. And so we just, you just made adjustments. we just shopped differently or, okay, this week, we're just going to clean out the cupboard. And I don't even know what the heck it's going to taste like, but we'll figure it out. Those were the kind of things that I wouldn't say kept me up at night, but were always in the back of my mind. And I think it's going to be in the back of my mind for a lot of people for a little bit longer, mm-hmm. uh, which is unfortunate. But I think that if we get away from the stigma of luxurious living or living outside of your means or stuff like that, we can get through it and living, I think living is going to look differently. And before this, like even Jess and I had a conversation, like generational living is probably going to become a thing where Mm -hmm. people can't afford to buy houses. And yeah, people are going to live, uh, multiple generations are going to live in the same house. And yeah, you want your kid to move out, but at the same time, like they need to think about, do we move out or do like, we really start contributing financially to the household and become an owner, part owner, or whatever it may be, right? Those, those are the things that are going to have to happen. And you look at different countries and different places in the world and finances are very different. We're not taxed a crazy amount compared to other places in the world where you could start at 50%. We have to look into those things. Those are the things in comparison to the world. And hopefully we can make the most out of what we have. And it's going to be a real mind change of the general public of what's going to have to happen. So Mm -hmm. I I think you are really smart and I'm so glad you said about erasing the stigma Mm -hmm. Uh, because I will be honest, that's probably if my family listens to this, that's the first time they would have heard that we struggled financially because we covered it up. We did not want Mm -hmm. anyone to know that we were struggling to pay gas. And I know saying that I'm going to get a phone call from my dad saying, "Uh, you could have asked me. I'm like, that's not the point, dad. But erasing that stigma, I think is so important. I would, I was mortified to tell people that we were struggling. And I also love the concept of generational living. Like why, now that I'm thinking about why in North America, 
do we believe that we can't? I'm kind of changing my mind about kicking the bird out of the nest now, um, <laughs> temporarily. I think that might be something that we are going to have to investigate and not necessarily for elderly parents, like we assume. The pay- price we paid for our house 10 years ago is nothing compared to what we would have to buy for a house. I completely get the struggle that you guys would have to buy a house. And it even doesn't matter whether you buy a house. But that's one of the things that we talk about is, are our kids going to be able to afford a house? And maybe it doesn't matter. Is owning a house the end all and be all like it used to be? So interesting concept. Yeah. But now I will say this on the flip side. We have built our financial life around the lifestyle that we want to live. That being said, so our credit cards are, we have points cards and we're, we are responsible with ours. I cannot speak for everyone. That's not what I'm saying. If you want to travel, then we've built our way to we can have travel credit cards to the point of we get better insurance through a rental car or every dollar that we spend gets put towards saving. So a lot of the times, like we could take a trip and not have to pay for it, or you can take a trip and the uh, accommodations are covered. Now, those are the kind of things that you have to look at of what's beneficial to you. Do the benefits outweigh the expenses um, of those things? Those are all things you need to look at. But if you're in a position where you are able to do that, yeah, you can build your life around the benefits of certain things that will, you know, either cash rewards or, you know, use PC banking because you spend a lot of money on food. Those are kinds of things that you can make small tweaks that can make a huge benefit for you in the long run. 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Certainly our credit cards. That's what we do as well. We have points that where do we want to go? Cause we like to travel too. Yeah. Interesting conversation. Obviously this is a conversation we're quite passionate about considering the time we've dedicated to this. I, I, and I know this is all in your guys's hearts. And, and again, I know I say this a lot, but I don't want to sound elitist. One of the things that I've done in the last two years is increase my charitable contributions. And I've done that because I recognize that I have been given a lot. And when I've been given a lot, I need to give a lot. So I'm putting a plug. If you can afford to do it, by all means, reach out to those who are, like you said, like $1.70 the gas is today, groceries, that type of thing. There's a lot of people struggling right now. And, and to remove that stigma, I think is super important. So yeah, mm-hmm. well done. Mm-hmm. So the only, uh, I think the last question that we're just going to bring up quickly, have you found any benefit from a financial advisor, especially during times of like unsteady markets? So for me, and, and this sounds really bad. I've been saying that a lot today. I trust my financial advisor and my financial advisor is a group of people, but I'll just call it a him because he's the guy I speak to the most. He really has planned out our lives to the point where it's, I trust him. And I I know, and I told him this as well, that my risk is really low. I don't want to invest in risky things because I know, I want to know that when I retire, this is how much money I have to take me through until whenever I die. So he has been invaluable to us in giving me a sense of security. Yeah, for, for me, I think it definitely has helped plan for my child's future. I've recently started also thinking and planning for my own, but it's also really helped on the business side of things to help reduce the amount of tax that I pay the government. So instead of just paying the what I used to in income tax, now I can put some of that into savings and reduce the amount that I pay for income tax. So it stays in my pocket versus just going back to the government. And I know the government gives a lot back to the community, but I also want to keep my money. So financial advisors definitely helped me in that side of things. Yeah, I, I agree for, especially during times of difficulty, you're like starting from the beginning. Um, I think a lot of financial institutions, if you already have a debit card or a checkings or a savings account, there's probably an opportunity for someone to talk to of how to set this up. So I would recommend our listeners to do that. Um, most financial institutions won't charge you to talk to an investor of how to set things up. So I would probably just say to do that because for me, I found it um, 
beneficial and a good place to start and get your foot in the door of ideas, which I think is great. And that's where we have found a huge thing is just in those gray areas, talking to someone who knows about it on a regular basis, you're not going to come to me about financial advice. I'm in the automotive industry. Let's hope that you're going to come to me for car advice or food advice. We'll talk to the experts and the people who know it. There's so many places out there now where people can get started for like dollars a month rather than like hundreds of thousands of dollars. So don't think that you need to spend a hundred dollars a month to, to get started. You can spend, you can start at $5 a month. It doesn't matter. Just start saving if you're able to for your future or even for a goal. It, it's nice to think of an opportunity to just get of it. And also if you're in a place and say it's a say or an RSP, I'm not giving you financial advice, but like you can look at the contribution room that you have and sometimes that is the hardest thing to do is because you looked at all the opportunities that you've missed out on if you were able to, but all that information is out there is easily accessible to Canadians. Can't speak for other places around the world because I don't know, but the information is out there. So just do your research properly, talk to a professional. And when you are talking to a professional, know how they're getting paid when you're investing with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what I say for today. <laughs> But I think, uh, I think that's a great place. And I know finance, like money is a hard thing. Financial literacy is an opportunity that everyone can learn more about. And I hope that our listeners would be willing to learn more about their financial position, their financial literacy. If you have any questions, just reach out to a financial advisor, talk to your bank. That's probably the best way to start. So until next time, we'll talk food. We'll talk fitness. And we'll do it together. <laughs>